the U.S. imposes ballistic missile sanctions on Iran a day after the nuclear deal is implemented, as Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu warns that Tehran is still pursuing atomic weapons and aims to destabilize the Middle East. Islamic State reportedly takes more than 400 civilians hostage when it attacks the Syrian city of Deir al-Zur. Some 300 others, including women and children, are believed massacred. And Pope Francis becomes the third Catholic leader to visit Rome's main synagogue. It comes as Jerusalem's Dormition Abbey Church is vandalized in a suspected hate crime. Good evening and welcome to the news today. We begin with the United States, which imposed new sanctions on 11 companies and individuals for supplying Iran's ballistic missile program. The U.S. Treasury Department enacted the penalties after the Obama administration reportedly delayed the action for more than two weeks until after the nuclear accord took effect and Washington finalized the prisoner exchange deal with Tehran. U.S. President Barack Obama issued the first public statement since yesterday yesterday's implementation of the agreement. We recognize that there remain profound differences between the United States and Iran. We remain steadfast in opposing Iran's destabilizing behavior elsewhere, including its threats against Israel and our Gulf partners, and its support for violent proxies in places like Syria and Yemen. We still have sanctions on Iran for its violations on, of human rights, for its support of terrorism and for its ballistic missile program, and we will continue to enforce these sanctions vigorously. Iran's recent missile test, for example, was a violation of its international obligations. And as a result, the United States is imposing sanctions on individuals and companies working to advance Iran's ballistic missile program, and we are going to remain vigilant about it. We're not going to waver in the defense of our security or that of our allies and partners. Yes, 24 hours, so many changes, and with me in the studio to make sense of it all, our mayors of the Donfar Iranian politics analyst. Good evening. Good evening. Amir Oren, defense and government analyst for Her Arts Daily. Good evening. And our very own diplomatic correspondent for the news today, Eli Hochenberg. Good evening, Good Eli. Good evening, Ayman. Well, Mayor, let's start with you. Uh, it was, it seemed to be like a great day for Iran. President Rouhani tweeted famously on Twitter that he thinks this is a big day for the Iranian people. What does this new sanction by the U.S. mean? It basically, well, it's in response to the ballistic missile test. And Mr. Rouhani is not in charge of Iran's ballistic missile program. This is for the IRGC. So the, mis so the message is from the United States, we are willing to reach a deal with the people in Iran who are willing to sit down and talk to us and to respect the deals that we reach with them, which is Mr. Rouhani. But at the same time, we are, we are, not going, we are going to punish those who challenge us in the region and challenge the, the United Nations. And that's the IRGC, and the, the way to challenge them is uh, with these new sanctions. Well, on the point of the sanctions, it seemed that everything that the West fears, these threats made against Israel, the nuclear aspirations, most of these, if not all of these, were made while Iran was under sanctions and isolated from the world. Now, does the West still have the same reasons to worry? When you say the West, uh, it seems as if um, there is still one intact block. But uh, diplomacy, and this is D-Day, D for diplomacy, but diplomacy is much more sophisticated than it was in the 50s or early 60s when Barack Obama was born, uh, for instance. At one time, the United States uh, tried to pursue a policy whereby it will have pacts and alliances, and everyone who belongs to such an alliance would be pro-American and would be supported by the Americans. So you were either for us or against us. And when there were non-aligned countries, such as India or Ghana or Egypt, the U.S. could not stand it. It wanted to see the picture in black and white. This has changed following the end of the Cold War. And there are several baskets in the relationship between the United States and even Russia. There are sanctions against Russia because of its invasion of the Ukraine. And nevertheless, the United States and Russia are the biggest partners in maintaining the world order. Vis-a-vis -vis Iran, 
there is a strategic partnership now, strategic relationship. Even though on the nuclear deal they agree, there are other areas which uh, Obama um, uh, mentioned, and of course there is competition, especially in this region. Well, you know, Eli, when Amir says you're either with us or against us, it makes me think of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin <laughs> Netanyahu. How much of a bittersweet win is this for him? Because on the one hand... Only bitter. Only bitter. Only because on bitter. the one hand, the threat, you could say the immediate one was removed, but the deal went through despite his reservations. Yes, well, Netanyahu keeps on warning uh, from uh, uh, Iran's regional uh, aspirations, its uh, sponsorship of terror, etc., etc. But, you know... Throughout the negotiations, what diplomats and leaders kept on saying is that the nuclear deal is unrelated to all other issues. But now, when the nuclear threat is off the table, we have we're facing many questions that we will, of course, deal with uh, further on in on our debate. The domestic politics, whether Rouhani will manage to take those uh, uh, those uh, frozen assets and now use them uh, uh, towards and, and, and utilize them towards uh, infrastructure, uh, reboosting economy, or will it all go to sponsoring terror? We have the uh, diplomatic uh, uh, aspect. Iran obviously wants to increase its regional power. We see that it is already setting a, a very respectable uh, uh, status when it comes to the Syrian uh, uh, crisis. So we will have to see how it will do in that. Front, and of course, the economic uh, aspect, which uh, it's obvious to all that there are only gains for all the ones involved. Well, Ellie, you summed up for us the dramatic events of the last 24 hours yeah. in the following report. Let's take a look now together and continue. Iran has completed the necessary preparatory steps. Expanding the horizon of opportunity for the Iranian people. Multinational and national economic and financial sanctions related to Iran's nuclear program are lifted in accordance with the GCPOA. The sense of accomplishment is undeniable. Diplomacy won, and the long-isolated Iran is now officially received with open arms as it joins the international community. It's truly one of the golden pages of the history of this country. But this outstanding finale did not come without a cost. Our diplomacy is at work with respect to Iran, where for the first time in a decade we've halted the progress of its nuclear program and reduced its stockpile of nuclear material. While U.S. President Barack Obama was hailing the agreement last week before implementation was officially launched, American sailors were in the hands of the Islamic Republic, which not so long ago tested ballistic missiles without any American opera whatsoever. Now, in light of the release of Americans being imprisoned in Iran, Obama's aim not to raise controversy is clearer, but his strategy is perceived by many as soft-handed. It didn't happen because it wasn't a priority for Barack Obama or John Kerry. They know that if you take an American hostage, Barack Obama will cut a deal with you. The reason they let the boat, the sailors go, is because in two days they were getting $150 billion. But suspicion is far from being a trend among the Republican Party alone. Israel will continue monitoring any international breaches by Iran, including the nuclear deal, the ballistic missile deal, and terrorism. Yet it's not only the obligations of Tehran to the world that counts now, but the compliance with the promises they've made to their people. It might have a psychological effect, but everything will eventually go back to where we started, and it might get even worse. That's why I don't think anything special will happen. Throughout the negotiations on the accord, leaders and diplomats have been stressing time and again that the nuclear issue is unrelated to all others. But now, as this threat has been ultimately thwarted, it remains to be seen whether Iran maintains its stance on human rights and terrorism, or will it seize the opportunity to become more liberal. Yes, let's join now to our conversation in the studio from Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. It's Camelia Intihabifard, news analyst and anchor. Good evening. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you, first of all, you're part of the generation that is intimately familiar with the revolution that changed Iran, and it seems that now the country seems to be on the brink of another historic change. Tell us about the meaning for the people of Iran. Is there a sense of hope? 
Um, I am from the first generation of the revolution, and in a comparison to what the new generations, the third generation of the revolution expecting, is quite very different. For them, the major problem to be having solved by this nuclear deal is the economical situation and also finding job. And plus, a little Iran's images would be lifted in international community. And uh, I'm seeing lots of hope among of them, but uh, I didn't see that much jubilant among of the ordinary Iranians this morning as it had happened when the nuclear accord has been agreed last summer in July. It may because they didn't see any changes during these six months in their life, in the economy, but perhaps in the long term they would see the results. But unfortunately, it's disappointing if we would say in the short term there wouldn't be that much changes in their life. Well, one of the things that's likely to happen in the short term, of course, is the flow of massive amounts of money. Some say an estimated $100 million. The amounts vary from one uh, source to another. Can you tell us how this is likely to change society from within Iran? Uh, this, not all those funds are available immediately, as what we read this morning from Iranian Treasury Bank. Uh, $32 billion would be released. The other amount would be released um, slowly, and also some of them are on debts. Iran has other debts, so has to be paid back. Uh, but in short term, of course, it would have some impacts, like the government is uh, short with the budget deficit, and also there are some, um, some delayed paychecks by the government employees and other sectors, which it can be covered. Uh, but with this uh, very uh, low price of the crude oils, and Iran begins pumping this morning, as President Rouhani says, I'm seeing the price of oil would be coming even less as it is. And we have to remember, Iran's oil is not the $30 one, it's cheaper. And Iran lost all the clients in the previous years of the sanctions. Uh, taking them back needs Iran to sell the oil with a great amount of discount. And some observers were saying this price wouldn't be about 20 or $22 per barrel for Iran. Um, so the short term, that would be some little changes because of those money you pointed out. But in the long term, it would take really time, maybe 20, 25 years, all infrastructures of Iran uh, can, can be uh, change and also the economy boosts that the investors find enough opportunity and security at the same time to invest in Iran's oil and gas uh, fields. So it takes a little bit of time. And Mr. Tihab Fard, Mayor Javedan Far here in our studio would also like to address you with a, a pointed question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, explanations. Enjoyed it very much. I just have a question. Don't you think Mr. Rouhani is setting the expectations a little bit too high? He, you know, the, the promises he's making of what Iran will be like after the sanctions are lifted, don't you think it will come back to haunt him? Because it seems to me that he's basically being, a, of course, he's a politician, but he's being a bit too hopeful. And if he doesn't manage to fulfill all his promises, then that's going to cost him. Salam bar uh, In my opinion, I am saying he needed to raise the hope so much high in order to win the election. And what he has been gained so far, he fulfilled his promises, right? But definitely, as what you pointed, from tomorrow, day after tomorrow, in the coming weeks, the disappointment would be filled the society by not seeing much changes. For example, the U.S. dollars currency's exchange rate with the Iranian currency real hasn't been so much drop uh, by the news breaking out yesterday it was like a very much little like 200 two months only and um, also I was speaking with my relatives today not not the big the changes that were expecting to be happen within a week or so. But in general, if Iran can be accountable power partner for the international society and it can prove that Iran is a safe and secure nation, which the foreign investors without fears can come to Iran, especially tourism, especially for the foreign tourism, wouldn't have the fears to be arrested and charged by uh, anonymous uh, unknown charges. So that that would be boost the economy. But okay. talking about other aspects, um, so the pre President Rouhani still have time to prove his promises before the next presidential election. 
Well, you know, one of the things we mentioned here in the debate tonight was the Israeli fears, the Israeli prime minister's fears, that Iran might not stick up to its, its end of the deal. In your view, how likely is that to happen, or how based is this fear? They would stick to the deal. Why? Uh, we have those incidents in the Persian Gulf a few days ago. American Marines has been arrested, has been detained, what we can call it. But the, the, the problem has been solved quickly, less than 24 hours. They have so much fear that everything behind the scene has been set up and agreed to be collapsed. Maybe some people were shows uh, Iran more gain of this deal, but in my opinion, the United States states deal more because for the U.S. they they has been agreed not only having those nuclear program pushed back or dismantle also release some Americans who has been detained for some years. Myself, I had more jubilee seeing those Americans going back home more than uh, implementation of the nuclear deal. I understand those all fears and those all abandonment in Iran. If we have the agreement and haven't had American free. That that were taking much more longer time taking them back, especially they have the election at the United States, and none of those candidates, even among of the Democrats, are not so much promising to be nice with Iran as President Obama. Um, of course, Iranian size the opportunity and they are going to stick to the deal because the regime was in a threat to be exploded from internal inside youth people, jobless and also frustrated, bad economy. Economy. That that was the survivor. The deal was a survivor for the regime. Yes, Kamelia and Tehabif are joining us from Dubai. Thank you very much for that enlightening talk. Oh, the Hafiz. <laughs> Amir Oren, I know you had stuff to say about Benjamin Netanyahu from before we saw the story tonight. Well, two and a half points, if I may. Um, We're counting. Yes. Okay. Um, you talked about the generation of the revolution. And obviously, and you talked about uh, Rouhani, but uh, without Khamenei, it wouldn't have happened. And uh, there is a historic pattern whereby Stalin is charismatic, but he doesn't deliver. And then comes Khrushchev, second one. Nasser is charismatic, but you need a Sadat. Fidel Castro, and there is a similarity here with Raul Castro and the prisoner exchange, which opened the way, the, the same platform. Uh, for the uh, relationship. And uh, now you have Khamenei, for all of his militancy, he enabled uh, this deal. Second point regarding Netanyahu. It's a great day for Israel, even though it's only a small day for Netanyahu, because this was the horse of the apocalypse which he rode for many years. Now he is left uh, without one. And, the, and half the point, we always talk about the um, unfrozen assets which Iran can now use. But there are also frozen assets which Israel has allotted to the anti-nuclear effort. Mm -hmm. all, of the, all of the billions of shekels which were allocated for the fight, for the Air Force, for the military maneuvers and preparations for the next uh, 10 years, most of that money can be used either for other defense needs or even better so for domestic needs. Well, schools, well at least money was uh, left behind. What about the diplomatic relations that were uh, soured due to his uh, campaign? That and I don't on think. That uh, point, is it really is, a great day for Israel and a small day for Netanyahu? Would you well, agree? Definitely, Netanyahu was maybe the most vocal opponent to this deal, no doubt about it. But uh, uh, the, the grave situation when it comes to the relations between Israel and the U.S. on the basis of the Iran nuclear deal, and it dates back to the time that U.S. officials used to wake up every single morning wondering if Israel will attack new Iranian nuclear facilities, and they were comp completely uh, uh, uninformed. So the, the, the damage when it comes to the diplomatic relations of Israel and the U.S. on the Iranian front, this is maybe one of the the toughest and biggest issues of this uh, post-nuclear uh, deal And it's era. the height of chutzpah to claim credit for what has been done, because Netanyahu, five or six years ago, was against the sanctions. He wanted only a military <laughs> yeah. blow. Intervention, and now yeah. he says, because oh, of, our, of our efforts, yes. we have come to this. Um, 
just one little point today. The, um, the Guardian Council has rejected 55% of all the candidates for the, uh, for the parliamentary elections. This is the highest number in the history of parliamentary elections, and this is going to cost uh, Rouhani. The news was announced today before the new sanctions against the missiles tests were announced by the Americans, and this was a big signal from the hardliners in Iran to Rouhani that we are watching you and we're going to prevent you capitalizing this on, on the domestic scene. Yes, well, just 24 hours after the announcement of the deal, already so much has happened. Gentlemen and lady, thank you very much for being with me tonight to make sense of this. We move now to Israel. An Israeli woman was killed this evening in a terrorist stabbing attack in her home, located in the West Bank town of Otniel. According to initial security assessments, the perpetrator entered Otniel, snuck into the woman's house, and stabbed her to death before fleeing the scene. Security forces have launched a large search of the area and set up roadblocks. Yes, with me now um, on the phone from Otniel is our defense correspondent Shai Benari. Shai, good evening. Shai, we know that uh, security forces have advised the people of Otniel to stay indoors while the search for the terrorist is ongoing. What is the situation there from where you are tonight? Yes, we are here at the entrance to Otniel, and there's a lot of security around here. You can see flares up in the skies as the search does go on actually in the surrounding villages, but also, as you mentioned, residents have been directed to stay indoors, and the possibility that the attacker, in this case, is still somewhere in the community has not been entirely ruled out, though the assessment is that he has probably escaped to one of the surrounding villages where searches are ongoing, as I said. Now, when you talk about this uh, particular case, we're talking about a 38-year-old woman who was killed by stab wounds when a uh, terrorist basically broke into her, her home stabbed her to death and even confirmed her death. This was done, unfortunately, uh, with her children present. The eldest daughter told the uh, head of the regional council here that, in fact, the terrorist was able to get away only because his knife was stuck in the body of the woman that he killed, and therefore he escaped uh, before he could do further damage. And Chai, what do we know about how the search is progressing at this point or any details about the attacker that uh, security forces have released? They, they still do not have an identity when it comes to, the, to exactly who car carried out this attack. There are searches we do know going on in the village of Khilat Karama, not far away. And as, the, as we've said, we can see a lot of military presence on the roads here, as well as flares up in the sky. But so far, they do not know who. Uh, we do know we're, we're talking about one perpetrator, no more. And apparently, they, he just he struck at one house and did, did not move on to other houses in the community. Yes, Shai ben -Ari, you will, of course, keep following that story for us from Otniel for I-24 News tonight. Thank you for being with us. Let's move now to Syria. Islamic State fighters reportedly kidnapped at least 400 civilians this weekend when they attacked government-held areas in the Syrian city of Deir el-Zur. Some 300 others, including women and children, are said to have been killed. I-24 News defense correspondent Shai ben -Ari reports. Reports have emerged from Syria of another massacre committed by Islamic State terrorists, this time in the eastern city of Deir Azur. IS has killed at least 135 people in ongoing fighting in the city since early Saturday, according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Over 80 of these are thought to be civilians, the rest pro-regime fighters. Syrian state media said the number of casualties was much higher. The terrorist organization of Islamic State committed a massacre in Beraliya, in the western countryside of Deir al-Azur, in which 300 citizens were killed, the majority of whom were elderly, women and children. Meanwhile, the human rights group added 400 civilians have been abducted by the terrorists. Sixty percent of the city of Deir al-Azur is now under Islamic State control, as the jihadists continue to fight forces loyal to President Bashar al-Assad. Russian military says its aircraft have recently dropped 22 tons of humanitarian aid in the area. Much of the region has been in IS hands for months now, and it is the source of most of the terrorist organization's oil wealth. And now for more on that story, I'm joined by senior Middle East analyst Ali Wakad. Ali, evening. good evening. Ali, this seems to be like it would be a serious blow, a serious setback for the forces of the Syrian regime. 
I'm not sure we are in front of a, a setback for the uh, regime, but yes, we are in front of a counterattack of the uh, Islamic State that is not hesitating to use any uh, uh, measure. And this time uh, in Deir Azur, the population that was massacred, slaughtered, abducted is a, a majority of Sunni uh, population, which shows that the uh, Islamic State is no more making any difference with, uh, between the uh, population as long as we are talking about regime uh, dominated uh, uh, areas. It was sending a clear message to the uh, population that what is seemed to be uh, 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 the fact that the Islamic State is a defensive doesn't mean that the Islamic State doesn't have the capacity to make such uh, atrocities if you continue to collaborate with the uh, with the regime. Uh, when we uh, saw in the telegram and other social media of the uh, Islamic State, the explanations that were there were uh, uh, ridiculous, and they were considered that the fact that the civil population of Deir Azur is not uh, uh, fighting against the, the regime, is not uh, trying to liberate Deir Azur from the uh, regime, it justifies all the measures taken by the uh, uh, Islamic State. But, uh, Ayman, Deir Azur is strategic because it is very close of uh, Raqqa, Raqqa, the capital in Syria, and of the caliphate. And if the if the regime will succeed to liberate the other parts of, of Deir Azur, it means that the Islamic State will be uh, taken between the Iraqi and Kurdish forces uh, um, in in uh, in the borders and between uh, uh, Raqqa and Mosul, which means that for the first time, the two capitals of the uh, Islamic State will be uh, caught by the uh, ground forces, uh, Iraqi on one hand on, and Syrian on the other hand, and of course from the air by both the international coalition and the Russians. And Ali, mentioning the uh, international coalition and the Russians, just in recent days we heard of huge bombings of the uh, financial sources of the Islamic State, but this doesn't seem to stop them from operating on the ground. I do agree with you, but we are we should not uh, have uh, a long and large uh, conclusions because of one attack that they are uh, succeeding to do uh, here and there. Uh, Al Qaeda, who is uh, for a long time on the uh, defensive, succeeded in the weekend uh, to strike in Burkina uh, uh, in Burkina Faso. But this doesn't mean that Al Qaeda is the same uh, strong organization of the late 90s, beginning of the two uh, of the two thousand uh, uh, here and there. We are going to see more and more uh, kind of these attacks of the Islamic State because these attacks are replacing the fact that they are not capable to invade towns, to occupy uh, towns. This is uh, the, the model, this is the instrument of the Islamic State, they say, to say that we are still here and we can uh, hurt you uh, here and there. But on the other hand, we can see that in Syria and in Iraq, this also reflects a kind of crisis that the Islamic State is living and to try to uh, convince its recruits and its members that it can fight this uh, 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 crisis, they are launching these kinds of attacks and elsewhere in Libya and in Lebanon and, uh, of course, Syria and Iraq. Yes, more war-torn news from troubled Syria. Ali Waket, thank you very thank you. much for that. We're off now for a two-minute break. In the news today, we'll be back with more. Stay with us.